Good evening and welcome to the webinar on UA Corporate Tax by HLB Hampt. As you all know, 9th December, the Ministry of Finance had published the Federal Degree Law Number 47 of 2022 on UA Corporate Tax Law, which is the content of today's webinar. A sincere gratitude to all who have joined us today across uh, for this webinar, and we ensure that today will be a very insightful session to one and all of you out there. Uh, HLB Hunt, we are an independent member of HLB International, with its presence across 157 countries and in the global ranking of 11th, it is an independent professional accounting firm across the world. And we have HLB Hunt, who is an independent, as I mentioned before, an independent member of HLB International. We were established in 1999 and we currently stand in the UA ranking of 7th with across seven offices and 3,000 clients, we provide seamless and efficient services across. Moving on, we have an international tax committee for our HLB. And as you can see in the slide here, we have Mr. David Springsteen, who is a global tax leader, Mr. Patrick, global in indirect tax leader, and Mr. Jay Krishnan, who is a partner of tax and compliance HLB Hunt. And these three members form the the International Tax Committee. And for this webinar of today, which where we will discuss more on the corporate tax law, introducing you the panelist for today's webinar, Mr. Jay Krishnan, who is the partner tax and compliance of HLB Hampt. With more than 25 years of experience, he uh, has uh, wide experience across many spectrums in UAE and India. Followed by, we have Mr. Sumesh Krishna, who is partner, audit and assurance of HLB Hampt, with an 18 years of experience in various fields, such as audit, accounting, risk management, quality assurance. He heads the audit and assurance division of HLB Hampt. Followed by our third panelist, Mr. Girish Nair, who is manager tax and compliance of HLB Hampt. Currently, he heads the VAT and ESR department of HLB Hampt, and he comes across with wide experience in internal audit tax reviews of large family-owned chemical industries, a wide spectrum of things. And those are the presenters for today's webinar. Before we start on with the content of the webinar, a quick note to all the attendees out there, our Q&A session is open. So towards the end, we will be discussing all the questions and queries that you have. So feel free to drop in your questions and queries and we'll be taking it towards the end of the session. So as you all know, on 31st January 2022 was when the announcement of UA corporate tax was done by the Ministry of Finance and they had established the FAQs along with it. And then by 20th of April 2022, they had launched the public consultation document, which was basically to invite comments from different stakeholders. And all of us had a chance to submit our comments by 20th of May 2022, even HLB had done it on behalf. And like that, after a very long waiting period, we had our uh, corporate tax federal degree law number 47 of 2022, which was issued on 3rd October, but it was published out by 9th December this month, 2022. And as you all know, corporate tax will come into effect from financial year on or after 1st June of 2023. So now I invite Mr. Jay Krishnan, partner tax and compliance of HLB Hunt, to give us more insights into how the UA corporate tax would create a new dimension in the taxation system of the country. Mr. JK, I invite you to add on a few words. Um, thank you, Reshma. And good afternoon to uh, all the attendees. And thank you so much for joining our webinar. Reshma was trying to explain uh, about the corporate tax timeline, which the, the, the degree law has already been announced in December. And uh, this law is effective from this month. You know, the law is already published in the official Gazette of UAE and it is already effective from 26th of October. Uh, though we have received the, the, the regulations a bit late, but this was signed by the minister in the month of October and they published in the Gazette. So the law is in place and it's effective from 26th of October in the country. So from the timeline, what we read is connected to that. Another regulation has been also announced very recently, but as that was also effective from 26th of October. It's called anti-abuse rule. 
which always you know in 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 conjunction with corporate tax this law is also announced which primarily means to say that any any transaction entering in or carrying out of any transactions or arrangement of business transactions if it is not for a valid commercial or other non fiscal reason which reflects economic activity or economic reality that is the the, the whole objective of implementing the anti uh, abuse rules as we all know since you know the law is effective and law is in place in the country any any restructuring plan or the tax plan or or any any changes made in the management structure or any grouping plans whatever with related to the, the corporate tax implementation would be under the radar of fta and as per this law uh, the the anti abuse rules say that you know it should be done with a valid reason that's it we should not do anything which you know just to avoid the taxes we should not plan anything or that is against the law so we have to take this rule also into consideration when we do any kind of you know implementation on corporate taxes from now uh, though the the tax dates are effective from 1st of june 2023 the law is already implemented in the country so we are in the radar of uh, this anti abuse rule so that is another important point which we need to uh, note down with related to this yeah, and, and this anti abuse rule in fact this is a global regulation so it's called gar so in line with gar uae is also issued this uh, regulations which we have to read in 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 you know like it's it's a connected regulation you know it's it's a global regulation so we have to note down this one that's it on this timeline reshma so you can go ahead thanks a lot mr jk yeah so let's commence with our webinar of today on ua corporate tax law and i invite mr girish nair who will take on the webinar from now on over to mr girish thank you uh, reshma thanks for the introduction and uh, thank you mr jk for Uh, pinching on one of the most important topic uh, which should be a subject of discussion by now on the general anti abuse rule now moving forward with the major areas and uh, uh, highlights on the corporate tax law the corporate tax rates as it was uh, announced in jan the rates are going to be 0% and 9% uh, for the qualifying uh, free zones now here also we have to categorize a uh, You, a, a, a main and normal uh, taxable person and a qualifying free zone person. So for the qualifying free zone person on the qualifying income, the rate is going to be zero percent, and non-qualifying income will be subject to nine percent. The taxable person, uh, a specific limit threshold will be set. The public consultation document highlighted that the threshold limit is going to be three hundred and seventy-five thousand. The threshold limit of the taxable income. over and above which the tax rate is going to be 9% below that it will be 0% but in the law which is published right now the public consultation document is void now so we we should not be following anything so in the law the limit is not published which we are expecting to be published in the following executive regulation which will be published soon by the uh, ministry of finance now the uh, there is a talk also going on uh, the multinational companies host turnover is you know um, uh, the global consolidated turnover is more than 750 million euros they are going to be taxed at a higher rate of 15% uh, in this month itself there was a news that came in that eu states the european union states have accepted that they are going to follow the follow the pillar 2 guidelines published by the oecd and they have accepted the minimum tax rate of 15% maybe the gcc countries including ua they would be following the same uh, footsteps on this we would like to have some insights from mr jay krishnan uh so uh, what are the latest updates and how it is going to impact the companies in ua the pillar 2 guidelines yeah thanks girish uh, see pillar 2 guideline by oecd is an important development um, we we have seen 15 percentage have, uh, like you know earlier in the public consultation document they mentioned that higher tax rate is going to be applicable on on certain class of companies with the huge turnover base and you know they have defined based on the oecd regulations what is the what are the kind of companies falling into the pillar 2 category you know these are you know uh, so but the, the the question is whether this is implemented in uae or not because this is a global regulation then recently we have seen a news from eu that you know they will be adopting this oecd pillar 2 regulations from next year so they have given one year to implement this regulations in in, in those regions and i feel that uh uae is also planning to implement that in the country though it's not published anywhere 
I think that could be the reason they have not mentioned 15 percentage or any higher tax rate for the multinational companies with you know consolidated global turnover of certain 750 million euro whatever. Though we expected that you know that top up tax or the higher tax rate is going to be applicable in UAE as well, but we have not seen in the in the, in the executive regulation no, in, the, in the decree law recently issued. But once the the the, the OECD and pillar two regulations are going to be implemented in UAE automatically. This minimum tax rate of 15 percentage is going to be applied in the in the country. Already we are aware that CBC, a country by country reporting, is in practice in the country. So, only thing, the modality of the operations on what are the the base figure or what is the methodology to compute or to assess a company for this purpose is a, a question mark. Whether this is going to be UAE based multinational entity or it's 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 a, any any multinational entity incorporated across the globe and then then operating in UAE is also a question mark because CBCR, the, the definition has been changed by the, the, the UAE authorities. So the, the higher tax rate is not seen as of now, but I expect this is going to be implemented from next year once, but awaiting the regulations on that. So once that is implemented, we can expect, but as of now, we have not seen uh, the, the mention about higher tax rates. Regular tax rates of zero percentage and nine percentage. That's it. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Mr. JK. Thank you. Now, regarding the effective date, uh, as everyone knows, the corporate tax will be effective for the companies whose financial year beginning begin on or after first June 2023. So basically, the companies, most of the companies in UAE follow Jan December uh, uh, financial year. So for them the effective uh, date is going to be 1st Jan 2024 for April, March following companies, mostly Indian companies who follow that for them, the effective date is going to be 1st April 2024 and July, June, it will be 1st July 2023. So companies who financial year start in July, August, September like that for them, the, the due date is nearing. And then, you know, you will have to, you will have to do necessary studies and assessments and everything uh, within uh, the next year itself within the first half of the, uh, 2023, because your financial is going to start. So you need to have necessary changes into your system and everything by before your financial year begins. Now, quickly, just uh, going through what is a taxable person? The, ta the taxable persons are, ca again, categorized into two different categories, resident and non-resident. Resident persons, of course, they are not going to, they are not going to leave any resident person. So they have just mentioned uh, a juridical person, a free zone person, foreign juridical person who is effectively and managed and controlled in the UAE, a natural person, even individuals. For individuals, just I would like to touch the point, the salaried income and everything is not taxable, but if a natural person, if an individual is carrying out any business activity in the nature of a business, not as, a profit, not as an employment, but in the nature of a business, then that then the taxable income earned from that business activity will be subject to corporate tax. Non-resident persons also would be uh, what to say. Uh, resident non-resident persons are persons who are not resident. They are categorized into non-resident uh, category. Now there are some pending decisions, as I said earlier. Many of the uh, clarifications are still pending, uh, which will be subject to the executive regulations, which will be published soon. Basically, now we are expecting that within another one month. So the executive regulations will come out. So that will be defining what is business, what is business activity and other conditions. This is applicable to many other discussions that is going to happen following. Now, uh, a resident person conducting a business, you know, for them, it will be taxable. But now in UAE, we have seen that there are certain uh, engagements which is in the form of unincorporated partnerships. Uh, which is like two natural persons or two taxable persons or two juridical or a, uh, what to say, a corporate a corporate uh, entities or one corporate entity and individual, they come into a partnership agreement and then they, you know, conduct business activity. So I would like to have opinion of Mr. Uh, Sumesh that how the taxability in that kind of uh, venture or a unincorporated partnership, the taxability will be decided. Uh, yeah, thank you, Girish. Uh, thank you for the question. So um, this is also a tricky point at the moment, but uh, I, I am trying to answer in an accounting perspective. 
So currently also there is uh, unincorporated entities doing uh, various business in UAE like joint ventures. There are two judicial persons are involving in certain projects or some uh, sometimes certain um, kind of infrastructure uh, development uh, programs. So uh, in that case, the current scenario is based on the, the mandates what they signed to do the business. You need to keep separate uh, records of the revenue in uh, the expenses on that basis, like proportionate basis or your scope basis. So uh, what I understand is that the books of accounts maintained on an unincorporated entity is more critical. So you need to have a proper set of books of accounts, which is identifying what is your revenue from that unincorporated business and what is your expenses, how you apportion, even that is including subject to the assets and liabilities also. Sometimes later you have a realization on certain assets, which is subject to the uh, capital gains and related matters. So unincorporated entity as an individual, it is not a taxable at the point. What we understand is that, but when you come into the business income of this individual or judicial person, you need to maintain separate set of books accounts to identify what is your revenue, net income and everything in that. That's what my part is. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sumesh. Thank you. So basically the persons involved in that unincorporated partnership will be subject to tax the earnings that they're getting from the you know business activity thank you yeah. now uh, the ua corporate tax law has also highlighted on the exempt person category what all types of persons are going to uh, fall into the exempt person so i'll just go through the list quickly a government entity government controlled entity uh, entity which is involved in the extractive business extractive means the oil uh, upstream oil companies who are into extractive business non extractive business that means who support the extractive business but are not involved in the extractive uh, activity, business activity, qualifying public entity, and then qualifying investment fund, public pension, public and private, public and private pension and social security fund, and any other persons which are directly or indirectly controlled, which are wholly owned by the above exempt persons will be considered as an exempt, uh, will be falling into the exempt category. Now, uh, for them, uh, you know, they, they should be having separate financials, they should be having proper records, they should be having proper uh, system, which must ensure that the revenue, that the item, uh, the income, the numbers that they are generating, it should be properly recorded, which uh, exempt persons needs to apply to the FTA. But that application may will be approved by the FTA. However, it will be subject to scrutiny in case they want to identify whether the exemption categories are fulfilled or not. And if it is not fulfilled, then yeah, they can have, uh, you know, uh, revoke the exemption uh, app uh, exemption approval, and then we will be subject to the corporate tax uh, category. We will be falling into the taxable category. So, an application needs to be submitted, and ex exemptions will be approved by the FTA on case-to-case -case basis after reviewing the necessary documents. Now, government entity and government controlled entity, uh, government entity, government controlled entity, both you know, uh, both are uh, falling under the exam category. The main highlight here is that transactions or any business activity happening between two government entities, even two government entities, uh, both are exempt persons, but even the transactions happening between them must be carried out at arm's length principle. The arm's length principle is a very stretched word, which is in which many people are, you know, it's a topic discussion uh, right now. So even uh, to, for, to be qualifying and to continue to qualify for the exemption category, the transactions happening between the entities must be at arm's length. So that is specifically mentioned in the corporate tax law. Extractive business, uh, as said, the upstream oil companies who you know involve in uh, uh, extracting uh, natural resources, they are anyway subject to emirate level taxation. There is already a emirate level taxation in place since the more than a decade. Uh, so that is already in place. So they are also fall into the, the exempt category. Uh, this is not applicable to the contractor, subcontractors who are involved in that. It is, it is only applicable to the licensees whose license activity mentions that they should be, they can carry out extraction business. For them, it will be, uh, you know, uh, the exemption will be applied as they are already separately taxed in a different law. Uh, now this extraction involved entity can have the earnings from other business. They can earn income from other business that will be subject to the UAE corporate tax law. 
the income generated from core extraction activity will not be uh, will not be subject to corporate tax but any other uh, revenue earned from the business or any other business activity apart from the extraction activity it will be subject to the uae corporate tax now non extractive natural uh, resources uh, this is uh, in line with the extraction business but those who support those there might be some companies who are uh, involved in any additional support to the extraction business so those uh, entities are also falling under the exemption category same they are uh, if they are they should be taxed right now at uh, emirate level uh, taxation or any other legislation which is in place if not then they will be coming under the ua corporate tax ambit and income derived from any other business of course they will be subject to ua uh, city law at the rate of 9% they will be taxed qualifying public benefit entity and uh, there are many entities uh, charitable organizations or institutions set up by the government for scientific research for promoting their culture and uh, uh, education healthcare environmental purposes humanitarian uh, institutions uh, animal protection animal welfare uh, you know uh, entities uh, created so as a professional entity a chamber of commerce or a similar entity operated exclusively for the promotion of any of the above list of above uh, said activities they will be considered as a qualifying public benefit entity with, uh, as said earlier they have to apply for the exemption which will be subject to the approval from the tax authority now qualifying investment fund this is a very important uh, point of discussion uh, as in investment funds we have you know uh, free zone or difc we have uh, abu dhabi uh, global market where investment companies they set up their offices to conduct business in ua now when the corporate tax comes in they might have to conduct certain assessment whether they are falling under the qualifying investment fund category or not so there are conditions specified uh, the investment fund is subject to any regulatory uh, review or a regulatory overview by any existing government or a competent authority uh, in the ua or a foreign authority it might be some some companies some institutions might be set up investment fund might be set up who might be under the who might be under the purview of any other foreign competent authority also recognized foreign competent authority they are also falling into the qualifying investment fund category the transactions or what the fund management the fund uh, you know investment the investments of the fund must be uh, in instruments which are traded on recognized stock exchange or instruments which are widely Uh, available to the investors across the market it is not it should not be any for any specific category of people or it should not be any specific uh, institutions or a, a separate category of uh, persons it must be widely available to investors the main or the principal purpose of investment fund is not to avoid corporate tax of course uh, this uh, you know any institution or uh, any arrangement should not be made to avoid corporate tax so if these conditions are satisfied then it will be considered as a qualifying uh, investment Uh, fund but in this uh, in the ambit of this uh, guideline which is published by the ministry of finance i would like to have an opinion from mr jay krishnan if you if, if if he wants to highlight any important aspects of a qualifying investment fund yeah thank you grish see like uh, grish was trying to explain on this chapter this chapter uh, is an exempted persons around 7 8 group of exempted persons are announced by the ministry through the decree law the first three points was mostly on on government and government controlled entities and then then the company involved in extraction of oil and natural resources which are subject to emirate level taxation i have not seen any any uh, mention about the the tax applicability on bankers foreign bankers operating in the country yeah earlier there was confusion because since they they are also under the emirate level taxation is it going to be taxed again you know double taxed one Why way of emirate level and then other way nine percentage corporate tax? There is no mention. I have not seen that. So I think you know in the executive regulations we can accept you know expect mention about that. Other than that, the exempted category person. See the the point of uh, you know the concern is we have to apply to the FTA for the exemption. You know uh, except for the government and government controlled entity and for the extracting business. The other portions which uh, Mr. Girish was trying to explain like qualifying investment fund. and other category of the, the the persons needs to apply to the fta with all the conditions terms and conditions and, and then you know fta will approve whether you qualify for the exemption or not until they approve it we are not exempt so the the you know every heading 
every chapter or every heading under this uh, subsections define some terms and conditions associated so before we apply make sure that you know we fall into that category and then we be complied with the, the terms and conditions associated and then apply with the fp otherwise you know simply uh, i'm uh, say for example i'm conducting qualifying investment fund yes if we don't fulfill the other terms and conditions associated then we may not be qualified to get the exemption from the fp we have experienced in, in when we handle the, the economic substance regulations and other regulations with fta they will thoroughly scrutinize it and then approve until approved you know it's it's kept open as a normal tax pay that's that is my view on this thank you thank you uh, mr jay krishnan now uh, we already have uh, income we already have a, a tax on the branch of a foreign bank at a, at the rate of 20% i would like to uh, have a comment from mr uh, somesh how the uh, the corporate tax uh, you know uh, will, will it be applicable to the branch of foreign bank in addition or how it is how the uh, setup is going to be uh, yeah girish um as we are also doing the certain um foreign bank audits we have some consultation with the bankers top people also but what we believe is that the uh, the bank is currently paying almost 20 percentage the foreign banks are taxed on 20 percentage in the mainland and the corporate tax is proposing 9 percentage so i don't think there might be a revision or on top of 20 percentage they may need to pay 9 percentage i'm not seeing that will happen but we need to wait for the clarifications so the public consultation documents are only saying about oil companies they are not specifically mentioning how the banking and the other financial companies who is the foreign company who is operating in the mainland so i think 20 percentage will remain so we need to see the executive regulation about that thank, thank you. you thank you mr somesh thank you now uh, considering the small uh, businesses in ua uh, the corporate tax law has considered their Uh, you know, uh, uh, try to reduce a uh, to make it more friendly and reduce a uh, burden on of administrative formalities and everything on the small businesses. They have said that the threshold of taxable income they can you know uh, the the small businesses can elect. It's an optional thing. They can elect based on the revenue, what revenue they are earning, and the revenue limit will be specified in the public clarification that uh, the executive regulation that will be published soon. so small businesses can apply for an exemption that okay if their revenue is this much and they are meeting the conditions specified in the executive regulation so over and above that only they will be uh, required to follow the corporate tax rules however they must be uh, following all other conditions specified by the executive regulations now it is not applicable to taxable persons who earn exempt income and uh, deductions and everything will not be allowed which we are going to discuss further such deductions tax loss relief uh and everything and any other reliefs or uh, ex- uh, what to say benefits given in the subsequent clauses it will not be ab- applicable to the small business who opt for the revenue threshold compliance now corporate tax base resident person uh, resident person we have two categories uh, maybe a judicial person and a natural person judicial person can have income from uae and from outside uae income from uh, ua will be subject to corporate tax if it is related to any of the business activity conducted any if it relates to the business or business activity in the ua natural person okay. also income derived from ua and outside ua will be subject to tax but what is the business what is the business act or what is the business activity and who uh, should be taxed where that an assessment needs to be done which will be subject to corporate tax regulations non resident person uh, they have to they should be having a permanent establishment in uae pe concept and they must be having a state sourced income and taxable income that is attributable to any kind of nexus or an arrangement uh, with any other entity or the business activity in uae so the pe uh, topic is what going to be the next one now fti has published what all uh, entities or what all types of business structure will be considered as a pe as you can see the inclusions place of management fixed place branch office factory workshop so what all will be considered as a, a pe that is considered in the inclusion we have to focus on the exclusion part mostly we have seen that there are many entities in ua who are who just support who who are just established to support their parent entity outside ua 
you know maybe uh, storing goods maybe facilitating the delivery maybe you know uh, having any sort of a uh, sort of a mediator office wherein uh, no contra uh, no negotiations or no contractual uh, authority or uh, signing authority is involved however they are just facilitating uh, the businesses to be conducted in the ua that will not be that all type of uh, setup will be considered as not a p to the non resident person and then that will keep the non resident person out of the ua corporate tax purview so this is the list given in the exclusion storing displaying there are many entities who just you know store the goods that the non resident person has to trade in uh, you know they sell in the ua so they just do the facilitation of storing the merchandise and everything and then maybe just delivering the goods so they will not be considered as a, a p of a non resident person so that is a list of exclusions that is specified dependent agent test this is going to be a very uh, uh, important area that we have to see dependent agent whether dependent agent or independent agent we have to do an assessment for example an entity is set up in ua for a for, for a non resident person if that non resident person is acting on a independent basis that means he is not representing any a uh, non resident person or is not acting on behalf of only just one non just one non resident person on a regular basis then that will be considered as an independent business category and will be considered as not a pe of a non resident person however there can be offices there can be business arrangement nexus between the non resident person and a and a dependent and an uh, entity in ua wherein if they are acting only for the non resident person fully for the non resident person carrying out any sort of activity on a regular day to day uh, routine basis that will satisfy the dependent agent test which will make them the pe of the non resident person and the non resident person will have to get registered and follow the corporate tax compliance they will have to file the returns they will have to pay the tax and all other benefits and relief will be available to them state sourced income now uh, state sourced income derived from a resident person it is not derived by it is derived from so if a person is there in a ua a resident person and if that person is earning or getting a revenue from a resident person or derived from a non resident person as i said the non resident person must have a pe and if a resident person is getting a revenue getting or is getting paid for any service provider or any or any goods sold and if they are getting any revenue from a non resident person then it must be assessed whether the non resident person whether the uh, amount received is linked to any pe of that non resident person in ua other than that if any assets located in ua if capital investments if the revenue is from a capital investment or we are using any uh, ip rights or services performed then all all that will be coming under the category of uh, state sourced income apart from this fta uh, the uh, corporate tax law has published what all other say state sourced income uh, will be considered under the ua corporate tax law investment manager exemption in investment manager exemption uh, category we have to assess whether the investment manager will be considered as a independent agent or a dependent agent if they are acting independently it it, it will not be considered as a p of the non resident person and the non resident person will not have to get registered but if the indip but if the investment manager uh, what to say if they are acting on a dependent basis if they are acting uh, if they are managing the fund if they are managing the investments for any one specific entity it will be considered as i said earlier as the dependent agent test will trigger and then the non resident person will have to get registered and follow the tax compliances exempt income exempt persons of course they are going to earn exempt income so what are the categories of exempt income uh, you know which will be sub which will not be subject to the corporate tax the domestic dividends and profit distributions foreign dividends and other profit distributions uh, any other income from a participating interest the participating uh, uh, interest will be discussed in the coming slides income of a foreign permanent establishment foreign permanent establishment means entity in uae having a foreign pe outside ua income derived by a non resident person from operating aircraft or ships in international transportation that is specifically categorized as an exempt income so persons who are involved in the business activity of operating aircraft and ships for international transportation it will not be subject to corporate tax one thing uh, i would like to have a clarification for uh, our opinion from mr somesh 
that income of a foreign permanent establishment now how to uh, identify or how to categorize okay uh, of course they would be having separate financials based since they are in different jurisdiction how the consolidation will be taking place in ua and uh, what all necessary uh, uh, process or controls they need to have if we have a p in outside uh, outside ua yeah girish uh, as you explained uh, previously that p can be a judicial person or a temporary arrangement in outside so both the cases this most likely a, a subsidiary of the ua entity subsidiary or kind of controlled entity so definitely they need to maintain the proper books of accounts they need to consolidate the financials and the uniform accounting policies also needs to be followed and the reporting also as per ifrs so these are the minimum conditions i believe that they need to follow and all the revenue and uh, expenditure related to that particular entity needs to be accounted separately and as usual the consolidation will happen in the group level but for the purpose of the tax calculation you need to exclude if the entity is uh, elected to of that the foreign entity is no, no need to include in the taxable income am i right that's right yes yes yeah yeah, yeah. so one more thing uh, i think there is a clause related to the um, uh, tax limit also right if the foreign uh, territory is uh, charging tax less than that the 9 percentage probably they are not eligible to adopt this i am not sure but we need to get the more clarity on that yes we are waiting for the same uh, you know to be published in the executive regulations we are waiting for that right. yeah that's right thank you thank you thank you mr samish thank you so this is uh, this is what uh, the exempt income what uh, the ua corporate tax law has uh, categorized in general now participation exemption as i said uh, what is participation uh, participating interest any entity having 5% or greater ownership in the shares or capital of a judicial person they it will be termed as having a participating interest now for the participating interest to be to qualify and to be coming under the exempt category the participating interest must be continued for an uninterrupted period of 12 months this 12 months can fall into two different financial years however if the intention so for example if i have have had a participating interest in the mid of a year then that means uh, i have only 6 months so i cannot prove that i have been holding for 12 months but at least if i have intention to prove or prove the intention that i will be holding it for 12 months then it will be coming under the participating interest category making eligible for exemption the ownership interest uh, the 5% it's over and above the share holding the participating entity my, might be uh, must be eligible for 5% of the profits which is available for distribution and 5% of the proceeds at the time of liquidation so that is termed as participating interest not more than 50% of direct and indirect assets of the participation consist of ownership interest or entitlements so this is what the participating exemption category has listed down the conditions to be satisfied to be exempt so if any entity having 5% and follow of owning 5% of any entity 5% or more and satisfying the above conditions it will be uh, falling into the exempt category and if income from a participating interest is income following income related to participating interest not considered for determining taxable income so while calculating the taxable income of an exempt person the below listed the dividends gains or losses on transfer or sale of the Uh, participating uh, holding the foreign exchange gains impairment gains or losses must not be considered in calculating the taxable income free zone persons this is uh, again uh, one of the most important topic discussed in ua companies in free zone are given the 0% tax uh, benefit but there are conditions to be satisfied there are certain approvals to be obtained from the tax authority so we will discuss in that this is a general brief of what are the number of free zones in each and every emirate with dubai leading with 30 uh, free zones in ua now who is a free zone person companies and branches or uh, companies and branches who are registered in a free zone is considered as a free zone person qualifying free zone person this is a new concept which they have not discussed in the public consultation document Uh, in detail but then now they have listed down what is a qualifying free zone person 
in the UAE tax law. The first and the foremost important uh, uh, thing is it they must maintain adequate substance in the UAE. I'll be touching that point again. They must be deriving qualifying income. Now, qualifying income, again, I'll come back to that, not elected to be subject to corporate tax. And, you know, they comply with the arm's length principle, maintaining proper documents. Now, adequate substance, the first point, it is not at all declared or it is not at all discussed in any of the law, even the economic substance regulation, which talks about economic substance, they have not mentioned what adequate substance is. So that definition still lacks clarity. Maybe we are expecting that in the executive regulations or else it will be pure judgment basis. Okay, what, adequ what is adequate substance that we have to, you know, we should, we, 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 we need to have more clarity and we need to understand depending on the company, depending on the industry to which the company belongs, what is adequate substance. Deriving qualifying income, what is qualifying income? In the first slide itself, we said that, okay, it will be 0% for qualifying income, 9% for qualifying, 9% uh, for non-qualifying income of the qualifying free zone person. So what is qualifying income? That also we have to wait for the corporate tax regulations, the executive regulations to be out. Then they must have elected, they must have informed the uh, tax authority that they are they don't want to be subject to corporate tax regulation complies with arm's length principle they must be following the arm's length principle guidelines and maintaining necessary documentation which we will be discussing uh, uh, ahead if these conditions are satisfied then they can be categorized as qualifying free zone person subject to zero percent tax additionally it is seen that in the public consultation document it was stated that they must be maintaining audited financials and uh, you know uh, every uh, regular audits and everything must be done to be eligible for zero percent. No such specific mention has been made right now, but as as and when the executive regulation will be published, we will see what additional conditions needs to be satisfied, if any. Now, period of tax incentive. Many of the free zones are set up to three decades back. And many of the companies are there since the beginning. Most of the companies have come up after that. So 0% uh, in the article uh, of the corporate tax law, it is specified that the 0% will be applicable for the remainder of the tax incentive period. Each free zone person, each free zone authority has published. They are going to give a tax incentive for, for example, 20 years or 25 years. So if a company, is, and that is 25 years from the inception of that free zone. So if the company is incorporated or the company is registered, maybe, you know, five years back and only five years is remaining, then they will be having the corporate tax incentive only for remainder period. The remaining, you know, there can uh, this remainder period can be extended by way of uh, executive regulations. They are going to publish whether this can be increased or not. And uh, this the period extended cannot be for more than 50 years. So, Mr. Jayakrishnan, I would like to have an insight from you how it is going to impact the free zone persons, what kind of evaluation they need to do, and what can be the possible course of action if uh, the decision, if the executive regulation publishes the conditions to be satisfied. Yes, thanks, Girish. See, this uh, topic about period of tax incentive is a, is a you know debatable uh, topic. The reason being, uh, this is specifically mentioned that the remainder of the tax tax incentive period should be looked into. So, an example we have seen, you know, when in many of the free zones operating in UAE that they advertise in most of the websites, the magazines, the publishings, everywhere they mention about, you know, tax holiday, tax free free zone. So you come and set up the company here, we are tax free. So once you announce that, I think it should they, should, they must have some regulatory backup for that. Every free zone will have their own rules and regulations. And the rules and regulations should have mentioned, you know, what is the period for which uh, an entity is going to be tax free in a particular free trade zone. So if they say 25 years from setup of the company or the setup of the free zone is a question mark. But I feel that this is going to be counted from the day when we incorporate a company. Say in 2020, incorporated company, if they say 25 years, 2045 would be the incentive period. So we have to see the regulations. You know, by the free zone authority. So every free zone advertised differently. Some free zones say 50 years, some free zones say 30 years, some free zones say 20 years. So it all depends on the, uh, the, the zone to zone. So we have to, you know, review the regulations and then ensure what is the period of incentive announcement by that particular zone. And 
you know the question is like girish was trying to explain the, the the previously set up company like say for example if a particular free zone announced that you know the, the company is qualified to get this incentive for 25 years what if in you know, a company is already expired like 25 years old we set up the company before 25 years imagine you know so there could be some companies operating in uae for more than 25 years in the same free zone so are they going to be taxed as per this announcement yes it is going to be taxed unless they have given a separate degree or separate announcement on on extension of the period so if they again you know come up with the extension of the tax holiday period through either a executive or, or a, a regulation or a separate announcement then again this company is going to be uh, qualified for further period of tax incentive which should not exceed 50 years as per this uh, degree law so the maximum extension extended period should not go more than 50 years you know if we or if the free zone opt to go for the extension that was the, the the topic so it all depends so we have to evaluate our company and see what is the remaining period of the tax incentive and then accordingly we have to act along with that girish was trying to explain about substance like he was mentioning substance there is no definition for the free zone entities there is you know it all mentioned adequate substance what is adequate for our entity should be assessed by ourselves because this is going to be a question mark for most of the free trade zone what is the substance to be uh, ensured so if i am a small entity i don't have an office space i don't have assets or or any any physical office in, in the country and and working virtually because the free zone issue virtual licenses so am i uh, complete in terms of the substance or not is a question mark so we have to ensure that or we have to prove to the fta in case they ask that you know my substance or my assets deployed or my other conditions associated for the the substance qualify for that so it all depends on company to company and and you know economic substance regulation specifically mentioned that if you don't have a substance you know if you don't have an asset so the other you know conditions to be fulfilled for maintaining the adequate substance you can outsource it in the country uae to another firm to do it let's say you know instead of you employ a certain number of employees in the country then you can outsource it so to a third party company only thing there should be an adequate substance that is why this specifically mentioned everywhere adequate so what is adequate is uh, our headache to prove with the fta in case they come up and ask this question that's it okay thank you thank you thank you mr jackson thank you now uh, deductible expenditure FTA, uh, the UAE corporate tax law has listed down what type of expenses will be allowed as a deduction. So allowable expenses will include, of course, expenses incurred for business and which are not capital in nature. So capital expenses will not be allowed as a deduction. Non-business expenses, exempt income, uh, expenses incurred for exempt income, losses which are not related to business and other expenditure, which will be, again, listed down in the executive regulations, will not be allowed. So expenses incurred for business and non capital in nature will be allowed as a deduction if expenditure incurred for more than one purpose now there can be cases where an expense is incurred to taxable income and an exempt income so how to identify and how to apportion the expense between a taxable income and a exempt income i would like to have a high level opinion from mr somesh yeah you see that uh, uae is acting as a regional office for many of the businesses actually let's assume that i will put as an example like your regional sales team is sitting here which they promote the service or uh, sales of the company who is located in ue so you you have a pool of expenses you are incurring here which is related to the outside business also so the standard is but uh, sorry the tax law is specifically mentioning that you need to identify a fair and reasonable basis to allocate this this can be based on the revenue or some other parameters like your cost drivers so you can look into the same sales stream and what are the cost drivers which you can correctly correlate with your expenditure so you need to have a proper documentation on each such type of costing what you made and i believe that you need to get it approved from the top management also usually to keep as a document in your books of accounts so that this is the basis this is the cost drivers or this is the revenue basis you need to allocate this uh, a particular expenditure so it there should be a clear visibility on the um, uh, chart of accounts of the company so probably some some uh, efforts needs to redraft the chart of accounts to identify this type of expenses also that is another, another point which everybody needs to look into that what are the system changes you need to do based on this tax implementations 
So this is what uh, I think it is. They need to have a clear visibility on what is allocated expenses and what is the basis, which needs to be documented and kept it in order to show to the authorities as and when required. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Samish. Thank you very much. Now, general interest deduction. The law has specified that, okay, there will be uh, companies who have borrowed funds, borrowed loans, and paying interest, expen uh, interest expense will be allowed as a uh, deduction. However, they have kept a limit of 30% of the EBITDA at the, while calculating the EBITDA earnings before interest tax, depreciation, and amortization. You can exclude the exempt income and then the EBITDA will be derived at. A small uh, uh, template is given as to how the interest expenditure incurred will be uh, calculated. So the interest expenditure incurred, again, some of the expenditure incurred may be disallowed in this tax period, which can be which can be carried forward to the next subsequent tax period, subsequent 10 tax periods, it can be carried forward. That also you can add to the expense incurred less the taxable interest income. If any interest income we have earned, that must be adjusted, that must be adjusted against the interest expense. And then the net interest expenditure will be allowed. Now, uh, net interest expenditure does not exceed a specified amount. Yeah, so that means if, the interest expenditure is above a specific limit, then that limit we have to wait for the executive regulations to be out. That is still yet to be published. Not applicable to persons who is a bank, an insurance provider, a natural person, a single person, or individual doing a business, and other excluded persons as may be published in the executive regulations. Now in this, the companies which are going to get highly impacted by this is the one who are highly levered, highly leveraged companies, you know, who have borrowed funds to get the task done to conduct the business activity. For them, it is going to be a huge impact. So uh, I would like to have an insight from Mr. Uh, Jay Krishnan, what such companies must evaluate or uh, what kind of, uh, you know, uh, plan of action must be undertaken by these companies where they are highly leveraged and they are paying high amount of interest, but their interest expense is limited to 30%. So they will be having a loss of paying corporate tax and paying, you know, uh, high interest, paying interest. So how, how can they rejig themselves from this? Yes, for your information, uh, this interest expense includes almost all the finance charges, all the finance costs. It is not only the bank interest or similar interest. It includes everything, like whatever we are posting under the, the heading of finance costs. So uh, this topic of capping the allowed, you know, permissible deduction of 30% of the EBITDA is going to impact heavily on the company uh, who is having, you know, high bank borrowings. Uh, the question is, if you work out, say, for example, uh, take one example, like, you know, 9% uh, corporate tax, and then we disallow uh, anything more than 30% of the EBITDA, uh, standard balance sheet or the PNL application, if we work out, then we can see that, you know, instead of 9%, effective tax rate is going to be almost 12 to 13% on an average basis, if this principle is going to apply. So this is going to be a huge impact on the finance in terms of, you know, extra outflow or taxes because of this uh, capping. That is one aspect. And then I, I think this degree law is trying to announce that there is going to be a, a limit of total finance cost or the interest amount, which is going to be falling under this capping provisions. Less than that, say, for example, if they come up with a provision that any interest less than 1 million dirhams in a year, you can fully deduct. And then anything more than 1 million is going to be capped with these terms and conditions. So the problem is a smaller and SME and, and smaller entity having you know smaller level of uh, bank facility will not have much impact if that is going to apply. But the, the highly leveraged companies are going to be highly affected because of this capping provisions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jay Krishnan. Thank you for that. Now, there is a specific interest deduction limitation rule. Now, specific interest dedu uh, deduction rule applies to interest paid to the related parties. So for example, if uh, we have borrowed a loan and we are paying a, a dividend to any related party from that loan and we are incurring an interest on that loan, but we are paying that uh, uh, the loan acquired to pay the dividend or distributing it as a profit or using utilizing that loan for redemption, purchase, reduction, or any adjustments to the share capital or a capital contribution. I'm taking a loan on interest and then I am uh, doing an investment in any of my related party or giving an unsecured loan or in whatever way and paying interest on that, acquiring an ownership interest. Interest expense on such kind of loan taken for those activities, it will not be allowed. 
and deduction allowed uh, if any loan is given inter company loan given will be uh, deduction will be allowed however the uh, strict uh, strict uh, scrutiny must be done whether the loan given on interest is not just for any tax advantage it is uh, properly for a business activity and it is a legitimate reason and if the corporate tax and if the uh, related party is subject to uh, is in a foreign jurisdiction and is subject to a tax rate of more than uh, 9% then uh, it can be understood that okay there is no corporate tax advantage for them they will be subject to anyways more than 9% so there is nothing uh, advantage to be taken off so this limitation rule will not be applicable to such type of entities entertainment expenditure they have uh, straight away said that 50% of the entertainment expense for the recreation or any amusement expenses for customers shareholders suppliers or other business partners they have not included employees here but we will have to wait for any clarity on the guidelines and the executive regulation they have included only customers shareholders suppliers and any other business partners so any of the expenses incurred for example meal expense any admission expense any accommodation expense facilities and equipment for recreational purposes any transportation expenses incurred and other expenses which will be specified by the executive regulations all those expenses will be allowed only up to 50% of the actual expense incurred non deductible expenses donations gift made to any non qualifying public entity as said in the previous slides in the beginning qualifying public entity and in those who are into this charitable uh, humanitarian scientific research activities if donations are made to any institution other than those qualifying public entity it will not be allowed as an expenditure fines and penalties in the clause it is mentioned that finance pen penalties other than the compensation given towards the breach of contract the word is uh, you know it is uh, debatable but it is very clear that if any compensation is paid towards any breach of contract that will be allowed as a deduction those compensation and everything will be specified in the contract the fines and penalties are not allowable as a uh, deduction bribes and illicit payments dividend dis dividends or profit distribution uh, withdrawn amount by natural taxable person you know uh, any amount withdrawn by an individual in his uh, for his expenses that will not be allowed as a deductible expense the corporate tax paid the value added tax of course that is altogether a different ambit the value uh, added tax will not be allowed as a uh, deduction tax on outside state income if we are paying any tax in any other jurisdiction that will not be allowed that will not be considered as a deductible expenditure unrealized gains and losses this is uh, something which requires more introspection from the ifrs point of view since uh, unrealized gains and losses it is subject to revaluations impairment uh, ua corporate tax law has given a optional uh, choice to consider gains as well as losses on realization basis on any assets and liabilities which are subject to fair value assessment and impairment testing as per the applicable ifrs standards any gains and losses on realization of capital assets that also will be can be included while calculating the taxable income but for the revenue assets they have taken any realized as well as unrealized gains can be considered the same was published in the public consultation document also i would like to have a opinion uh, from uh, mr somesh that how the fair value uh, uh, fair valuation assessment or impairment testing what type of assets are involved in this and uh, what type of companies are going to get impacted or how they can or who will be eligible to comply with this regulations Yeah, Girish. This is again uh, another accounting challenge by uh, looking the perspective of uh, the normal books of accounts maintained under IFRS as well as the backup which you need to make for the tax filing. So uh, I'll put uh, one or two examples like um, the property, plant and equipment, investment property. These are the usual common assets which is subject to the fair valuation. So uh, in IFRS perspective, when you look into the investment properties, you need to go with IAS 40 and uh, IAS 16 for the plant and machinery. Then you need to subject to the IFRS 13 for the fair value measurement. So considering all this, we usually go with an investment property with a market value or fair value with a valuer who is valued, and you appreciate the value or depreciate the value and account it. And the changes, the your depreciations also subject to change based on this. so considering this aspect of the vat so you cannot move the fair value gain or loss through the pnl that means you need to adjust back to the uh, your uh, tax calculation revenue adjust with the taxable income uh, 
so this is what uh, my understanding so that you need to continue recognizing the fair value measurement in your books of account as per ifrs itself but you need to have a separate reconciliation needs to be made for your taxable aside and similarly they mentioned that uh, the assets uh, so the fair value adjustments or impairment testing also uh, related to the revenue items we are talking about the balance sheet items so the revenue items mostly that is inventory or work in progress or development in progress these are considered as assets which is subject to the revenue items so let's say you have inventories under foreign currencies so you need to do a revaluation so the foreign currency change the currency uh, change at the closing rate also considered as a fair value change so these are the items which i think you can directly adjust in the pnl there is no need to do a adjustments on the taxable revenue similarly any impairment on the development in progress or maybe work in progress these are maybe adjustable along with the taxable income that's what i'm thinking right now so probably the uh, executive regulation will give more clarity on that thank you rish thank you thank you very much mr somesh thank you now tax loss many of the uh, questions that we have received even before the corporate tax law came in now after the corporate tax law came this is the uh, uh, hot uh, topic of discussion tax losses will be allowed it can it will be it can be carried forward indefinitely there is no uh, what to say a period specified up to which the tax losses can be carried forward it can be carried forward in, in, uh, indefinitely however the adjustments can be done only up to 75% of the taxable income so the loss set off can be done only up to 75% of the taxable income the remaining can be carried forward to subsequent periods now there are certain conditions to be satisfied the persons the owner ownership interest in the taxable person who is carrying forward the loss the same person must own at least 50% of the ownership uh, interest and if there is any change in the ownership interest then the business activity of the taxable person the entity must be the same though there is a change in the ownership interest by more than 50% now the company is listed in recognized stock exchanges there can be change in the ownership stru structure frequently so for them the change in the ownership shareholding uh, percentage is not mandatory they have to follow that they have to uh, fulfill that condition to carry forward the loss they can Uh, carry forward up to uh, indefinite period as uh, specified no tax loss relief if any losses that we have that a taxable person or an entity has incurred before the commencement of corporate tax law it will not be allowed losses incurred before a tax before a person becomes a taxable person because there is a certain limit we will have to wait for the executive regulations to be out who will be eligible to apply for being a taxable person till that if any loss is incurred they cannot utilize that that loss will not be allowed to be carried forward or adjusted against future profits losses incurred from an asset or an activity which is related to any exempt income so if any loss is incurred against an activity through which they were earning exempt income that exempt income cannot be adjusted the loss cannot be utilized to ad adjust that exempt income transfer of tax loss now one entity buying another entity one entity acquiring another entity so one entity can acquire a entity who has uh, loss losses accumulated over a period of you know their existence so th these are the conditions that needs to be uh, satisfied for the transfer of tax loss to be uh, benefited by the transferee so both the tax persons must be judicial persons both must be resident the ownership interest must be 75% the 75% ownership interest can be direct or indirect or a third person can have 75% uh, ownership in both the companies the transferer and the transferee existence of com common ownership must be there during that beginning of the period in which the tax loss has incurred the ownership structure might should have been there in the transfer transferee transaction no persons should be an exempt uh, person none of the person should be a qualifying free zone person they must be following the same financial year and they must be applying the same accounting standards these are the conditions that needs to be fulfilled to be eligible for a transfer of tax loss from the transferer to transferee here also the same 75% of the loss set off will be applied tax grouping 
Now, as in uh, value added tax, tax grouping provisions are available in uh, UAE corporate tax law also, which is optional. Now, as the diagram says, a mainline entity having a free zone entity and other three LLC entities, the mainline entity can group the entities. However, there are certain conditions. That is, the grouping can be done only for the judicial persons. The parent entity must hold at least 95% of the entity which they want to group. The parent entity holds 95% of the voting rights also. They have uh, rights over 95% of the subsidiary's profits. The parent company nor the subsidiary company must be an exempt person. They should not be either, they either should not be a qualifying person also. They both, the grouped entities must be following the same financial year and they must be using the same accounting standards. So same uh, conditions, which is for the transfer of tax loss, the same conditions has to be followed except the 95%. There it is 75% direct or indirect interest. Here it is direct ownership interest of parent company of 95%. To on the subsidiary. So if this condition is satisfied, we can apply for a grouping and then a tax group can be created. Date of formation and cessation of a tax group. Now, before that, I would like to have an opinion of Mr. Jay Krishnan for the tax group. What are the challenges that an entity can face in UAE at the time of applying for a tax group? And you know, the tax group is done basically to reduce the administrative formalities. So what are the challenges? they are going to face if they go for a tax grouping or what evaluation needs to be done? See, the tax grouping will reduce a lot of administrative difficulties for the taxpayers. That is, a, the, the, that is why this concept has introduced. Uh, because grouping, uh, we have seen practically the grouping concept in, in EAT. So if you group, say, eight or nine entities in one tax group, you don't need to file separate uh, tax returns for all the entities. Instead, you can compute all the tax liability in one entity as if in one entity and then then you can register with the fta uh, for that group but the conditions are like you have to be careful on on choosing the entities because there are some conditions associated which is on the screen now so we have to ensure that whether this is complete or not before we apply for the grouping number one number two and uh, as i mentioned in the initial uh, stage you know anti-abuse law is in place now so since the corporate tax is also effective in the country, so now if we wanted to group with the qualifying shareholding percentage mentioned is 95 percentage. If we feel that this is not 95 percent, instead I have only say 60 percent of the shareholding and then uh, my my subsidiary company, they still uh, all, all the other conditions are done, but I have my shares of 60 percentage. So to qualify for the tax grouping, we might think of you know increasing or enhancing the shareholding percentage of those entities to, to 95 percentage for this uh, tax purpose. What is happening is this is going to be under the, the scrutiny by the FTA whether what is the purpose of doing it. You know, like if, if it's, a, it's, a, it's a, you know, genuine kind of planning and then, then tax planning, yes, probably the FTA will allow that. But if that is going to, you know, have a negative tax impact for the government entities or for the, the FTA, they might ask you a question, why are you doing it? And then we should be able to answer those queries. So basically, before we go for a tax grouping now, tax grouping is quite simple. We can apply if we uh, see the conditions are complete or not. But the restructuring made now or later, because of the tax grouping uh, concept, needs to be under the scrutiny of the FTA so that we, we all need to be careful now. Otherwise, there is no other complexity uh, on, on tax grouping, which is already explained by Girish. And yeah, that's my view. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. JK. Yeah. Now, date of formation and succession of a tax group. That is, uh, when the tax group will be formed, what is the formation date? What is the succession uh, date? All that will be specified in the, uh, what to say, the application approved by the tax authorities. So that will be the effective date of formation. What will be the effective date of the tax group ceasing to exist? All that will be specified in the application, which will be approved by the tax authorities. So we have to do the application. They will approve. They will issue the necessary registration documents or approval documents. And then where it will be specified, the starting and when it is going to end at the time of respective applications. Now regarding taxable income of a tax group, this is uh, what to say, uh, what all uh, what all should be considered or what all adjustments can be made to the tax group of you know multiple entities that belong that now are grouped to the 
parent entity for the tax registration uh, tax formality purposes. The unutilized tax loss of newly joined subsidiary, carry forward loss of tax group, taxable income, they can be utilized to set off the future taxable income of the tax group, which is attributable to that specific subsidiary whose loss is transferred. Join new subsidiary uh, uh, to the tax group, then available unutilized tax loss of existing tax group, it cannot be set off. So if any subsidiary is joined and if they are having any uh, tax loss, it can be carried forward and adjusted against the income, which is attributable to that specific subsidiary. So that extent, the tax loss can be uh, utilized. Now the uh, reliefs, what all reliefs are available in the corporate tax law? Transfers within a qualifying group. Now there can be transfers that is happening between two related entities, which will be treated as a transfer within a qualifying group. Now what is the transfer of one or more assets between two taxable persons that are members of the same qualifying group? So if one entity is owning 75% of the other entity, or if one common owner is owning 75% of two entities, and if there is a transfer of assets happening between those two entities, then that will be sub that that will not be subject to any corporate tax. However, there are certain conditions that needs to be fulfilled. Either of the persons should not be an exempt person, and it should not be a qualifying free zone person. The financial year must be same. The same accounting standards must be followed. It will not be applicable if within two years of the transfer there has been a transfer of that asset or a liability outside the group. If the transfer has had taken place, or the assets which are already transferred, and if the transfer is taking place again within two years outside the group, this relief will not be available. Or if the taxable person ceased to be members of the same qualifying group. So if either of the member ceased to exist to be a part of that group, then also the relief will not be available to them. Business restructuring relief. The business restructuring can happen by way of mergers or acquisitions. The same, again, the same conditions are specified that shares or other ownership interest of held by one entity on the other entity, then neither a gain or loss needs to be considered if the conditions are satisfied. The transfer is undertaken in accordance with the law, uh, with the uh, terms and conditions imposed by the specific legislation in the state. The taxable person are resident persons or non-resident person that have a PE. They are neither an exempt person, neither a qualifying free zone person. The financial year is same. The accounting standards are, are same. Accounting standards are followed in preparing the financials. And the transfer is undertaken for valid commercial reasons. They are specifying again for valid commercial reasons uh, to enhance that it must be in line with their business nature or there must be proper synergic benefits arising because of that business restructuring. Then the relief will be available. However, if it will not be applicable, like in the earlier case, if within the two years, if there is any change in the structure, if the, if, if the business engagement by way of business restructuring is not validated within the two years, if it does not exist in the same way, then, it will, uh, then the relief will not be available to the taxable person. Withholding tax and foreign uh, tax credit. Withholding tax, as announced in the public consultation document, and again uh, specified in the UAE tax law, it will be at the rate of 0%, which will be applicable on state-sourced income derived by a non-resident person. Again, this is very important, non-resident person not having a PE or any other income as specified by the minister. It will be published in the executive regulation on what all types of income the withholding tax at the rate of 0% will be available. The credit of withholding tax, which is paid, it will be available up to a maximum of the withholding tax deducted or the corporate tax due. So whichever is less, you can claim the deduction. If the withholding tax you have paid is higher than the corporate tax due, then you can claim till the corporate tax due and then you can set it off against the corporate tax payable. If the withholding tax is less, you can take the credit of the 100% withholding tax amount. Now foreign tax credit, corporate tax due for the taxable period can be reduced by the amount of foreign tax credit. Any tax paid in a foreign jurisdiction for the income earned there, and we are consolidating and reporting the revenue here and including the same in the calculation of the corporate tax in UAE, the foreign tax credit can be availed. That also up to the maximum of the corporate tax due, unutilized foreign tax credit cannot be carried forward. 
So if you are having a foreign tax credit and uh, the corporate tax due amount is less, so there will be balanced foreign tax credit, but that cannot be carried forward. However, the taxable person must maintain all the necessary records and documents to prove that, okay, they have paid the foreign the tax uh, at, in a foreign jurisdiction. All the necessary documents must be maintained. Transfer pricing, another important topic. We are expecting that a separate regulation will be issued by the UAE Ministry of Finance on transfer pricing. However, nothing is issued as of now. But they have emphasized on arm's length principle and transactions. What type of transactions should be subject to arm's length principle? So transactions and arrangements between related parties, they have emphasized that it must meet the arm's length principle. What is arm's length? I'll just quickly read out. Result of related party transaction. The arm's length principle is the value at which the transaction happening between taxable person and a third party. The transaction with the related party must happen in the same conditions. There should not be any favorable condition to a related party which can violate the arm's length principle. Now, transfer pricing methods. The transfer pricing methods are published by the OECD guidelines. It is a five plus one method, the cup, the comparable uh, uncontrolled price method, the resale price method, cost plus method, transaction net margin method, transaction profit split method. Again, they have given a category where any other method can be applied, which can be, you know, which may, uh, the five methods may not be applicable. There can be any other method which can be applied, but it has to be very reasonable and proper substantiation and clarifications must be given of for applying that sixth method. Now, factors to be considered when you select transfer pricing method, the contractual terms, the transaction between the, it, this, this terms has to be evaluated from the related party uh, point of view. So any transaction happening with the related party below factors must be evaluated. The contractual terms, the characteristics of the engage uh, of the transaction or the type of engagement, the economic circumstances that gave rise to transacting with the related party, the FAR analysis, the FAR analysis will involve uh, functional assets and risk involved analysis and the business strategies employed. Why we are transacting with a related party at a certain value? What are the reasons? What benefit we are getting? Is it in line with the standards? Is it is it the practice that has been followed in the industry? All that assessment needs to be done. Now, tax authority involvement. Transfer pricing is the area where the tax litigation is going to happen. The reason being, it is not a specific, you know, there is no specific return statement as to how or what needs to be done to arrive at the arm's length principle. It is a judgmental thing. It can be, it will differ from industry to industry. Even companies belonging to the same industry of same size, the factors to be considered can differ based on various, you know, uh, various other factors. So tax authorities will be scrutinizing it very strictly to understand where the transactions are not carried out in arm's length principle. What are the issues arising out of that? And what factors are influencing the taxable person to conduct a, a transaction not in arm's length principle. So they will evaluate all this. And if it is not in line with the arm's length principle, they will be enforcing the adjustments to be done to the taxable income. And then uh, what uh, if, the if the taxable income rises, then the necessary tax due on the increased taxable income must be paid along with the uh, penalties and everything which will be published in the due course in the tax procedures law in line with the corporate tax. So this, the litigation uh, is an area where companies must ensure that wherever they are conducting a, a related party transaction, uh, litigation risk is going to be you know, uh, there. Related parties and control. Now, uh, what is a related party? Uh, owning a 50% or greater interest in the judicial person control, exercising 50% of the voting rights, the board of directors, more than 50% or more of the board of directors is assigned by the main entity or the parent entity, receiving 50% of the profits, emphasizing significant influence on the daily decision-making or any business activity of the uh, of any person, that will give rise to related party relation. Now, these are uh, what are the list of related parties? If it is a natural person, then fourth degree of uh, kinship by way of adoption or guardianship or any other affiliation will be considered as a related party to a natural person. What are the natural, uh, what are the related party to a judicial person? What is the related party to a PE or a trust? All that it is listed in the regulations. 
payments to connected persons there are many 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 questions are arising on this front that if we are making any payment to any connected persons what is the limit of deduction or how how we can claim the deduction on that so connected persons have been defined as the owner of the taxable person the director or any officer the definition of officer is still not clear we have to wait for the executive regulations to be out the related party of the owner or the director or the officer and the partners in unincorporated partnership and related parties so payment to this any of the connected persons category as explained in the adjacent box that has to be at arms length it is very specifically they have mentioned arms length uh, rule will be applicable and it must be incurred wholly and exclusively for the purpose of the taxable persons business so we must be proving so whatever payment is done to a connected person it must be established that this is to conduct the business routine business as in line with the arms length principle now documentation documentation they have specifically mentioned that uh, uh, transfer pricing uh, disclosure form master file and local file everything uh, needs to be maintained however we are waiting for the executive regulations to pen out if there is any specific limit or a threshold of the value of related party transactions over and above which the companies must be maintaining master file local file or disclosure current understanding proves that disclosure requirement will be mandatory for all the entities entering into a related party even for one dirham the disclosure will be mandatory but for master file and local file there can be a specific limit over and above which the document needs to be maintained i need to get a, a opinion from mr jk are we really expecting any threshold as in other tax jurisdictions or is there any other way of putting a limit on the related party transactions over and above which the document needs to be maintained thanks girish uh, i'm not sure about uh, the, the uae's authorities plan to put up some you know threshold not sure but unlike like saudi arabia we have seen the threshold uh, the question is even if threshold is implemented or not the minimum level of documentation is mandatory so if we do any any transaction with either a related party or a connected person the minimum documentation is mandatory only thing there is a threshold and then we exceed the threshold or no then the, the enhanced like uh, local file master file maintenance is mandatory but even otherwise we should be careful going forward you know after this corporate tax regulations are announced that you know the, the documentation should be uh, taken care separately because otherwise this is going to be a challenging for to to prove with the authority how how you identify the a person as a related party and then what steps you have adopted to to make sure that the transaction is valued at the, the market price or arms length uh, you know prices so this is going to be a challenge and one more point quickly i will come back to that point because i think we are running short of time managerial remuneration which we normally see in in the, in the profit and loss account of a company the remuneration to be paid to a managing director or an officer this has been clarified that those kind of provisions or, or the, the expenses are going to be under the market pricing model now arms length market price model so the remuneration paid to managing director or to any officer of a company should be in line with the market value so there should be a guideline what is the market value of a particular transaction for every entity so basically we have to follow that and then based on that we have to arrive that market value and then anything we pay more than that is going to be non deductible expenses for the corporate tax purpose thank you thank you mr jake now final corporate tax due calculation how to calculate it it's after the uh, what set offs are available so corporate tax due we get a, we get the benefit of uh, taking the credit of the withholding tax paid any foreign tax credit other credits or relief and whatever the balance that will be the final corporate tax due payable which must be paid within 9 months from the end of the relevant uh, tax period tax registration any person shall register as a taxable person the conditions are yet to be out tax returns now as said no later than 9 months within the within 9 months from the end of the relevant tax period the tax returns has to be filed mr sumesh can quickly give us a guidance on how the tax returns are going to be what are the contents of that yeah thank you girish so you can see that financial year um, the immediate financial year after the corporate uh, tax implementation so if your financial year is beginning 1st july 2023 so your first closing will be 30th june and your return will be 31st march 2025 and your financial year is 2024 jan beginning then as usual the calendar year itself and the first filing will be on september 2025 30th september 
and the others 1st april 2024 and 31st march 2025 so that is falling on 31st uh, december 2025 so whoever is following the april the financial year is in 1st april so that's fall on 2025 so usually all the details related to the tax return is already explained here the you need to specifically mention what the tax period and the details of your tax registration number date of submission and total uh, the basis of accounting what uh, you followed accrual or cash basis and everything then taxable income and what is the tax relief you claimed and the carry forward loss adjustments and tax credit and corporate tax payable the final output is that so this is a general overview of the tax return so far what we know actually And definitely uh, part of the whole uh, tax filing uh, purpose, the financial statement is very mandatory for everybody. So uh, who, whoever having different trade licenses and everything, so you need to have the financial statement prepared in order to prove that the taxable income is disclosed properly. And uh, certain categories of persons require to prepare and maintain audited and certified financial statement which especially when you look into the um, uh, free zone companies who deal with the mainland uh, uh, business so you need to have a proper separate financial statements available and the record keeping as uh, everybody knows that the uae generally follows a seven year documentation period which you need to keep all the related accounting documents intact this is all apart from the normal transfer pricing documentation which girish explained before yeah so yeah now regarding the assessment of corporate tax and penalties now uh, after the return submission tax assessor or the authorities will be assessing the tax returns submitted and they will be asking for some queries they will be doing some uh, notifications or orders for response and after the response is given they will be giving uh, tax assessment orders uh, for which uh, they will be mentioning if there is any non compliance observed if there is no non compliance then they will be giving a clean sheet if yes then we, they will be asking for further clarification if proper response is not given or if any response is not given or if any delayed response that can give rise to penalty and interest so this uh, practice as we are following for as is, is it, it is followed for vat the same will be followed for corporate tax also the tax procedures law will specifically uh, mention if any additional uh, assessment practice will be applicable for corporate tax or not transitional rules uh, mr somesh i would like to have a, a opinion uh, from you on the transitional rules that will be applicable to the taxable persons yeah see generally uh, every company is uh, maintaining ifrs financial statements but as far as there is no transfer pricing uh, rule in this country so that is uh, most critical now while we are going to a tax fully tax region so uh, the companies needs to prepare uh, a financial statement which reflect the normal arms length transaction between the related parties so this is an additional financial statement apart from the audited financial statement or internal financial statement they prepared for management purpose you need to keep a proper opening balances by adjusting the related party transactions to the market price or whatever the method be uh, discussed earlier so that is the benchmark financial statement for going to the tax regime so everything will be matched with that so this might be an additional work for the accountants and additional work for the management to identify proper taxation the arms length pricing mechanisms if the group companies already have some mechanisms in place then definitely they can revisit and adopt in uh, uae itself otherwise the companies who is in the uae who is not at all uh, familiar with arms length transaction they might employ somebody who knows the arms length principles and how they can fix the mechanism then rework on these balances and adjust the financial statements the, the income statement balance sheet and everything and keep it ready to embrace the corporate tax regime in uae thank you thank you very much uh, mr somesh thank you now clarifications as i said earlier uh, in between the discussion also there are still some clarifications that needs to be uh, you know published by the uh, ministry of uh, finance by way of executive regulations on the basis of which only we can decide okay how we have to act forward what is exactly applicable to a taxable person what all necessary changes we need to make to the existing atmosphere of an a taxable uh, person all that can be evaluated once the executive regulations is published whether any advance pricing agreement this advance pricing agreement is subject is related to transfer pricing so we will have to see whether the tax authorities will be coming up with any advance pricing arrangement 
between the taxpayer and the tax authority. So we will have to evaluate all that. We have to wait for the time being. Yeah, Reshma, over to you. Yes. Uh, thanks a lot, Mr. Girish, and big thanks to our co-panelist, Mr. Jake and Mr. Sumesh as well. So we tried to provide a very consolidated version of our federal degree law number 47 of 2022. Hope it could provide to some extent a very simplified approach going forward as the country is facing uh, the in implementation of corporate tax very soon. So without further delay, let us go through the Q&A that we have received. So we have received a good number of Q&A, but let's take it one by one and let's try responding to it. All right, uh, first question I'm asking that to Mr. J.K. The question is, what is the general rule on qualified free zone person and qualified income? The general rule on qualified free zone person and uh, free zone income is, as per the public consultation document, the revenue generated from international operations. That was the fundamental regulations to make sure that we are in the quali we are having qualifying income. So any local income is going to be taxed at a regular rate, and any non-local income, which is an international revenue, are going to be taxed at zero percentage. That was the definition provided in the in the public consultation document. But you know we have not seen the same definition in in in, in the in the decree law. But instead they said qualifying income. I think the the, the definition is going to be mostly the same. Uh, and the qualifying free zone are you know there is no specific de definition for qualifying free zone. Instead you know we presume that these are uh, any 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 company operating in any of the registered free trade zones in UAE having the substance and other terms and conditions which we have explained earlier. So the, the important question is whether we, we we are complying with that, you know, conditions or not. A free zone company with that uh, compliance, including that substance, could be qualified as a, as a qualified free zone entity. So it's uh, any company, you know, including an offshore company registered in any of the approved free zones in UAE. That is a terminology. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Jacob. Mr. Sumesh, a question to you. For foreign banks, what will be the adjustment of deferred tax assets? So deferred tax also, it is not at clear at the moment. We need to wait for the executive regulations. That's all we can say at the moment because only the 9% tax, which is applicable to the mainstream entities in the UAE, only they announced. So banks, I think what is the current status quo may remain or they will come up with the more detailed ones, yeah. Mr. Girish, a question to you. If a free zone company sells to UA mainland or other UA free zone as well to outside UA, so they're selling to UA mainland, other UA free zones and outside UA, is the tax applicable on the UA sales component only? And if it is only on the UA component, is the portion of tax applicable calculated based on revenue? Yes, a free zone company selling uh, goods in the mainland, it will be subject to a UA corporate tax. And if the free zone company is uh, trading with any other free zone company, it will not be subject to corporate uh, tax. It will be subject to a 0%. But then, as I said, there are certain conditions that needs to be fulfilled to be a qualifying free zone person and all. Now, regarding whether how the cost allocation will be done, it will be done on the revenue earned basis. It has to be a portion, it has the proportionate uh, the cost will be apportioned on proportionate basis. What is uh, what is my taxable income? What is my non-taxable income? And what are the expenses incurred? It will be apportioned on the revenue uh, basis. They have uh, given a line in the corporate tax law on that. So the apportionment will take place on revenue basis, yes. Okay. Uh, Mr. Jake, a question again to you. Is zakat allowed as deductions? Zakat allowed as a deduction is a debatable question, which... Uh... See, what is mentioned is donations paid to any any uh, charity organizations which is not listed as per the, the ministry or the, the authority are going to be disqualified for the deduction. That was the announcement. I think Zakat is also counted in the... Uh, we need to wait again, the same thing, uh, wait for the regulations, whether Zakat is considered as a, as, a, as a legal form of paying donations to the registered entity or not. If yes, of course, uh, my personal feeling is that yes, they're going to allow zakat as a, as a deductible expenses. But again, we have to wait and see. Okay, thank you, Mr. Jake. A question to Mr. Girish. In case of a tax group, 
if the owner is having various companies which are registered under mainland and some of free zones, then what is the remedy? How to register under a tax group? No, then you'll have to come to us first. We will have we will evaluate. We will be charging for that advice. No, uh, going, 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 just like that. But the thing is, we will see the evaluation has to be done. What is the parent entity? Where is the parent entity located? Is it a mainland company? Is it a qualifying free zone person? The group grouping can be done, but then provided the conditions listed down is satisfied or not. So if all the conditions satisfied, the grouping, but then uh, the remedy, the regarding the remedy, can you just repeat what the question was? No, he just mentioned would it would there be any remedies and how to register under a tax group? So provided the tax group has various companies registered under mainland and other free zones. Yeah, because the the component is one company in free zone, other companies in the mainland, then then uh, that will be disqualified for, for the grouping. No, when yeah, the grouping can... cannot be done. Grouping yeah. cannot be done. Uh, as as said, the exempt persons, the qualifying free zone persons cannot be grouped with other entities. So uh, that grouping cannot be done. The mainland entities will have to be grouped separately. So a mix and a grouping wouldn't happen. Will not happen. No. Yes. Mainland to be grouped separately. We cannot consider the free zone entity for the grouping groups. That's it. But mainland entities can be grouped. Okay. Yeah. Hope that provided a good clarity. So some other questions to Mr. J.K. Is the limitation of interest applicable only if interest payment exceeds one crore during the financial year, or irrespective of the interest amount? I, I think I mentioned about it. There is no mention about one crore, one million. There, there, is, there was no mention about that. If the executive regulations are coming up with a, a cap, say anything, half a million, five, up to 500,000 grams of total finance cost is deductible fully, then, then we are free. We can fully uh, deduct it. But if they come up with a limit, anything more than 500,000 is subject to 30% discapping is going to be a question. As of now, they have not mentioned any, any amount. You know, I, I guess that to support the small and medium-sized entities, because everywhere the, the tax authorities trying to say that they wanted to support the small and, and medium-sized entities. As a part of that relief, probably they might come up with this threshold. But if there is no threshold, this is applicable to all the entities, regardless of what is the amount uh, we have booked in the in the financial statements. But as of now, there is no mention about one growth in any of the financial, any, any of the degree loan. Okay, and just one more question. Since this is to Mr. Jacob, we have multiple trade license in the UAE for which we do not maintain separate books of accounts. We have combined financial statements. Is it mandatory to keep separate books of accounts trade license wise? Like what filing, can we register all our trade license under one group? Yes, we can group the trade license in, in one group provided that the other conditions are fulfilled because uh, Girish was trying to explain earlier some conditions before we go for the grouping. Yeah, Certain shareholding percentage, etc. has to be fulfilled before we go for that application. So once we have done it, yes, the similar concept of VAT grouping and we will be filing the taxes through one company only or, or the, the, the parent entity only. The question is about the financial statement or the books of accounts maintenance because there are a few regulations already in the country starting from commercial company regulations and then it has gone to VAT level. It has gone to now corporate tax level. There was an economic substance regulation. So every regulations, if you separately read, you know, all the regulations mandate all the, the licensees operating in the country to have a financial statements, separate financial statements. But as of now, no regulatory authorities are coming and asking, do we have a trade license wise uh, trial balance or not? Unless you know the, the FTA take our case for the audit, specific audit for the VAT or for any other purpose. If they take it as an audit case, first question they're asking is show me the individual trial balances. Or, or we have to produce the individual financial statements to the, the tax authority. So the answer to the question is already the law in the country mandate the entities to maintain the books of accounts separately. But how practically this is possible? Is a, is a different uh, question. But for the corporate tax as well, the working should be done individually and grouping is just an administrative grouping. That's it. We are not grouping the, the, the accounts. Accounts should be separately maintained and grouping is only for the tax return filing. So we have to have a separate financial, separate profit and loss account, separate balance sheet for individual entity as per the law. And that is going to be more stricter because of the uh, corporate tax implementation. So we, we have to have a system or a mechanism to bifurcate the total trial, combined trial balance into individual um, company-wise going forward. There is no doubt about it. Okay. Mr. Girish, another question to you. 
Some of the shareholder assets are being utilized for the operations of our company without paying any fee. Example, land for parking vehicles, office building, etc. If we start paying rent for these facilities and reduce from our profits, thereby pay lower tax, will the shareholder's income be considered under corporate tax? No, uh, see, that will be considered as, of course, it will be coming under the category that as income is derived from an asset, whether that has been conducted regularly or not, whether they are doing the same activity with any other entities or any other, whether they are engaging into that kind of business model with any other entity or any other taxable person or not, that we will have to evaluate. In VAT, we have a concept of deemed supply, but in the corporate tax law, uh, nothing has been talked about deemed supply as of now. Maybe FTA can consider that, but generally that will be, uh, you know, uh, again, we will have to wait for further clarity as some of the conditions are satisfied, which will make that towards applicable to corporate tax. As in, as I said, assets are here in UE and I'm getting a revenue from that, but then that will be applicable to even real estate industry where an individual is owning a property and getting rent from that. I am owning, only, I am owning two properties. I'm living in one property, the other I have rented out. Will that be subject to corporate tax or not? I'm not conducting any business activity. It is just that I have an asset I have given to an entity and I'm getting revenue from that, which is not routine in nature. I'm not conducting that regular basis. I'm not having a license to do that. So that may not be subject to corporate tax, but we'll have to wait for further guidelines on that. But uh, my opinion, it will it will not be subject to corporate tax. Thanks a lot, Mr. Girish. One last question to Mr. JK. We operate from multiple Emirates in the UAE. Do we have to file Emirate-wise financial statements or just a consolidated one? Data needs to be maintained. Emirate-wise data needs to be maintained, at least in terms of revenue, like the way we do for VAT. But again, that is, there is no mention about that because this is a federal tax. End of the day, uh, this revenue needs to be shared between the Emirates according to the business we generate or the profit we generate from particular Emirate. But here the question is, you know, since the tax base is profit, not the revenue, uh, is it practically possible to maintain the profitability on Emirate wise? That is going to be very challenging for all the organizations as I feel because Emirate wise profitability is going to be difficult unless we are operating through a, a branch licenses, separate offices, separate profit centers been in place, then, then it's easy. Otherwise, uh, computing the, the say a company operating in Dubai, they have, you know, juristic, like they have business across the, the country and then maintaining profitability on each Emirate is going to be difficult. I don't think uh, the regulations are going to come up with that, but there could be some mechanism that in the in the, in the the corporate tax return, there should be some information about Emirate versus data. Either it can be revenue or it can be something else. Based on that, at least you can have a proportionate working or whatever. So because and the tax authority needs to identify what is the value of profits you're generating from particular emirate based on that only they can share it so there could be a mechanism but what is that mechanism and what is going to be that columns in the in the tax return is subject to you know the the, the decree law i mean the, the executive regulations but i don't think it's going to be complicated maintaining separate tracking for the profitability of emirate is going to be challenging for all the entities if they wanted to present it in that way uh, thank you mr jk last question to mr girish any mention about the depreciation rates for the fixed assets no, no mention for the depreciation rates. Uh, we were expecting that, uh, we, but we are uh, we expect that in the future it will be announced uh, because wherever tax differences in all tax jurisdictions, depreciation rates differ from what we follow from the book accounting principle to the tax principle. The depreciation rates are going to be different, which can give rise to uh, defer tax uh, asset or liability calculations based on the timing difference. It can give rise. So. In the due course, it will be published. Right now, it will, right now it is not there. Nothing is published, but in the due course, it will be there. Yeah, we are expecting that. So thank you, Mr. JK and Mr. Girish for the Q&A session as well. So there is a lot more questions. We have almost 100 plus questions that's here. So what we will be doing is we'll be sharing out uh, highlights of this webinar. Along with that, we will be answering to each of your questions and we'll be sharing it to our email to all the attendees who had joining us for this webinar today. So that brings an end to this wonderful webinar that we had. Hope it was really valuable and insightful to all of you attendees out there. And a big shout out and thanks to our panelists, Mr. JK, Mr. Sumesh, and Mr. Girish for guiding us through this webinar. Also a shout out to the organizers of this webinar, that is Mr. Suhail and the entire design team. 
So thank you and a sincere gratitude to each and every one of you who have joined us for this webinar. Have a very wonderful evening ahead. Thank you, thanks a lot. And then do mail us if you have any queries or any assistance that you require, you can always contact us at tax at hlbhampt.com and we will be reverting you via emails. So thank you, thanks a lot. To thank, you so much. thank you so much everyone for the attendance and our team from our office is going to contact you individually to, to understand your requirements specifically on corporate access, which you can respond to him model which you're looking for you can discuss with that uh, you know those teams and then, then we'll we'll again come for meeting you or whatever the way support you require you can always be in touch with us uh, we are here to support you for the implementations advisory transfer pricing because there are a few areas where you know the, we are not familiar with let's say connected persons related parties and, and and those provisions which needs an immediate attention to fix that you know we are in line with the regulations and as i mentioned earlier uh, there is uh, anti-abuse law is also in place so we have to be careful before we do it so that's it from our side. So again, thank you so much for coming and, and, and listening to us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you.